firstly, the great joy of being here with you all. And I think that if I can add anything today, let me try and add something to the journey that you're embarking on here. Um, <clears throat> somebody asked me last night when I got hijacked if, if I still do anything in the arts, and my answer was I've rediscovered music 20 years after being told I was 80% deaf, and my career went like that at that time. I now have a state-of-the-art hearing aid, so here it is. O dolce barcio languide carezze. That's what I used to do. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a long time ago, and that was at the Metropolitan Opera Company, and I frankly spent a lot more time enjoying going down the road after the show to work at the Village Vanguard and play jazz, which was my first love. So my going back to passion and music now is about jazz. But my narrative in terms of the last 20 some years has been very privileged in terms of my uh, social entrepreneurship, I guess, is what most people seem to think I am. Uh, and it's taken me from the barricades of the front line of that in terms of work with Greenpeace for a number of years. And then I started realizing that the game was a bit more complex than just the barricades. And uh, I started working um, in the, uh, both the business community uh, and in various forms of government. I spent a long time in negotiating situations around the planet. And uh, then finally I thought, well, I need to retire. I'm, I'm getting too, too old. So um, the board at the time uh, of the organization that I was the chief executive of, I said to them, You've, you don't need me anymore. You're doing great work yourselves. You're, I'm out of here. And they said, well, leave us with an idea. And I thought, I'll come up with the silliest idea I possibly can to make sure this is an exit strategy out of the building. So the next day I came back and I said, how about we create, uh, to honor our most famous global citizen, an international prize, an international awards program in global leadership. And um, they sort of looked stunned at me and uh, said, uh, great. And I said, okay, I'm out of here. And I went. And the phone rang that night, and the chairman said, we want you to come back tomorrow. And I said, no, 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 I've got enough corporate watchers. I, I don't need to come back. He said, no, 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 we want you back. And uh, so I came back, and they looked at me as a board again, and they said, you're not out of business. We are. We've dissolved the board. You're right. We as individual companies are doing interesting work. We don't need you. Here's $100,000. Do it. So I was suddenly hoisted on this idea um, which I had quite frankly come up with as an exit strategy. And I guess the life lesson from this is for those of you who are very keen on planning, uh, that in my view, if you make a serious enough plan, the gods are almost certain to laugh at you. Uh, and so I've learned to uh, perhaps listen a bit more to the resonance around us rather than trying to play the game by the rules that you think you should be playing. So that led me on a rather wonderful journey, which I quickly then had to take seriously. I began by, strangely enough, I had never met Sir Edmund Hillary. Um, and uh, the first two people I brought together on this with me were, were a former Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister of this country, David Cagle. Um, and I said, look, tell me this is a bad idea because I want you to help me build an international board. He said, no, I think it's a great idea. I'm with you. Then I had to find a bag man to build some initial capital. So I went to my brother-in-law, who's a famous ex-opera singer and also a sportsman. He ran New Zealand cricket for some years. And um, I said, tell me this is a terrible idea. He said, no, I think it's great. I'm with you. So I then said, let's get on the plane and talk to Sir Edmund. And he said, no, 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 you get on the plane and talk to Sir Edmund. So here I was. Ed was 85. Um, he met me, he shook my hand, before I could say anything, he said, I've Googled you. And my heart sank, because for any of you who would like to Google me, there's quite a lot about me on the, the net, and like anyone, about 10% of it is, is, is real, and the rest of it is whatever. Uh, with a twinkle in his eye, before I could say anything, he then said, where are we going to do this? Not should we do this, am I prepared to allow you to do this, where are we going to do this? And I was still, as you can tell, I'm not usually lost for words. I was still trying to find an answer to something here. And he said, well, how about we do it inside of the Maunga? Too many things happen in Auckland. And the Maunga he was talking about, of course, was Cook in the South Island. Aurangi, which was the mountain that he, in his youth, trained on, which was the foundation on which he then built his later career as perhaps the world's most preeminent, uh, preeminent mountaineer of his generation. And so I said, well, 
let's do that, Ed. Let's, let's do that. So I then spent 18 months uh, working with him because the only condition he put on us was that we didn't do this until we were ready. Um, and that's 18 months of work. So on my 50th birthday, he told me, uh, well, he didn't. The day before my 50th birthday, we were in Antarctica. He said, I'm going to launch this tomorrow off the ice. I said, it's my 50th birthday. I'll be on the phone all day. He looked at me with one of those stares, which reminded me why he was such a global icon. And uh, I was confusing him with someone who gave a damn about my 50th birthday. He announced it. A year later, sadly, I spent my 51st birthday burying him. Um, and so we only had him for a year. And, um, but as an inspiration in terms of leadership. I always remember the metaphor that Ed liked to use, which was the mountain we have to climb as ourselves. And that uh, is a great gift, and it stuck with me. So here we are eight years on. We have uh, built a modest organization. We have had the enormous pleasure to focus on leadership in mid-career. So we're interested in people in play now. As I said earlier briefly, we don't work with starlets. Um, and we don't work with old farts like me who are on the way to retirement. We look for people who are dynamic and in play, and we try to make sure that we can give them some further leverage in terms of the work they do. So leadership in what? Well, leadership in mid-career. But then we realized it had to be, it was still too broad. So by that stage, we'd built an international board and it included a number of quite interesting people. Regenda Pachari, who I'm sure many of you will be aware of, a Nobel winning laureate head of the IPCC. Paul Hawken, my old friend from, uh, many of, a friend to many of you here from San Francisco. Uh, Kevin Roberts, the global head of Saatchi's. Um, and um, Manfred Ketz de Vries, uh, who was one of the founders of INSEAD and Fontainebleau, Train's chief executive over the last 30 some years. It was a very interesting group of people. The leadership in what question was concluded quite quickly. It decided they wanted to work in the first four years on the zeitgeist issue of our time, climate change. So after four years of working on climate change, they then decided they wanted to spend another four working in it, and they nuanced it slightly to climate equity. So in that time, we have created uh, six global laureates. And how that works is, as I said, I'm a glorified scout. I spend most of my time looking around the planet and taking feed and recommendations because you cannot self-nominate from a community that we have built over that time who tell us, here's an interesting person you should be looking at. And so we, they don't know, it's blind, the process is blind. So for instance, when we rang our very first laureate who's uh, Jeremy Leggett, a preeminent Englishman working as you know, the forefront of the solar industry for many years, now heavily involved in stranded assets work, heavily involved in peak oil work, uh, an icon, really, in, in, in the UK community. He was up a tree in Bolivia putting up a solar plant, and um, there was a pause because he thought we were winding. Who, who are you people? We're the Hillary Institute from New Zealand. We want to honor you as our first global laureate. There was another pause, and then he said, well, you know what? I was born in the year Sir Edmund Hillary climbed Mount Everest, and I'd be on it. And thankfully, from then on, they have all been incredibly gracious in the response that they've had to our search. And that family now includes the two latest uh, laureates, 2013, Atossa Sultani, uh, of course, a remarkable figure in terms of her life's work in the Amazon, and Mike Brune, who's currently running, of course, America's largest and oldest environmental uh, society, uh, the Sierra Club. Uh, in the middle, there's been a number of other very interesting characters. We have laureates from China. We have uh, a friend of mine in terms of Tuakan Atena, the closest we've got to our own country, President Anoti Tong of Kiribati. Uh, Anoti is in the front line of the impacts of climate change. Uh, there is no hiding from climate change. There is no comfortable place you can go to in his tiny group of atolls up there in the Northern Pacific. He has no escape. He is as he says, in terms of his whakapapa, in terms of his 4,000-year lineage, in terms of his family tree, his father is 85. He spends his entire time rebuilding the rock wall next to the Urupa, where his ancestors have been buried for generations. He rebuilds that rock wall every two weeks or so now because it's continually washing over. Anotti himself is now 65. He says his father will die there. He says, I will also die there, but I cannot and I will not make the same promise to my eight children. So he is actively pursuing a policy now where he is training his young Kiribati in skill sets which are absolutely designed to take them out of the history of their homeland and into the international community. This is real politic. 
This is deep emotion. This is real impact, uh, and it's palpable. And I encourage any of you who, who want to experience firsthand what a community of scale is having to deal with in terms of the front lines of this issue, go to Kiribati. The good news is you'll have to be with that community for a week. There's only one plane in, there's only one plane out. And um, it goes on a weekly basis. So that's, in a nutshell, the story I would have told you in far greater detail about what it is that we do, and that's great, and we continue to do this, and I hope we can continue to do this for many more years to come and build gradually this community of laureates who are now starting to work together as well. So Mike and Atosa have come together with a proposition which we're starting to craft next week, or next month uh, in San Francisco, which is designed for the Paris round in December in terms of the overall political process around climate change. It's an exciting project. I can't tell you anymore. I'm sworn to secrecy. Let me reflect very briefly, however, on what this means in terms of today's Kopapa, which is the culture of this land I had the good fortune to be born in. And I'm a Hapa. I have mixed blood. I come from a long line on my mother's side of French Jews. On my father's side, I come from a mixed tradition, which is part Naitahu, the largest tribe in the South Island, and Scots. So, like a lot of us here in this room, I think the richness of diversity in your own um, um, lineage and history is, is, is a hugely valuable thing, if over time, you take the time to learn to understand those threads, and I still need to do more of that work. But I've also spent most of my adult life in both of those major chapters of work outside of New Zealand, and I still am in the privileged position uh, Peter mentioned uh, before our diaspora, second largest in the world. 22 to 25 percent of Kiwis are offshore. The reality of that now, however, is that if you look at the productive cycle of their uh, employment, they are increasingly spending more of that time offshore in markets where they are very well received and in markets where they frequently excel and they are slower to come home. And part of the reason, in my view, they are slower to come home is that we as a nation in recent years, and we've heard these stats today in various ways, have lost, I think, the fire in the belly in many ways that enabled some of those sporadic bursts of genuinely progressive leadership which have occurred. And we heard the list, and it's a list which is often repeated, punching above our weight, first votes for women, the nuke campaigns, anti-apartheid. These are all moments in our history. Do they reflect a, cult a culture which is matured in the sense that it is constantly on the forefront of progressive leadership? No. We have a culture here which is, with one notable exception, which is beginning to learn the lessons of honouring the treaty in terms of how we are starting to relate to the Tangta Whenua of this nation, and I'm talking the royal we here, in terms of how we are building and realising the value of that as our core. But generally speaking, this country is, in my view, lacking a clear sense, coherent sense of vision currently. It's lacking a coherent sense of, therefore, where do we as individuals fit within it. It's lacking a clear sense of how we can encourage that diaspora to contribute back to this country. And it's lacking a sense, therefore, and obviously this room is an exception to that, of generating enough excitement. Sam, thank you for that reference again to Raf's wonderful idea of encouraging a global citizenry to come to this country and get excited about making a contribution. And yes, where are you, Nigel? We should have a policy now which encourages the best we can possibly attract to this country to actually be a part of contributing to what reimagining Aotearoa might be. And I think that, to me, that is really the nexus of New Zealand really coming into its own a combination of giving appropriate and real value to our core treaty partners, to working here on the enormous richness of the indigenous knowledge that is in this, in this place, marrying that with the wonderful polyglot of people who have come here over generations as well. But for God's sake, let's give us a sense of where we're going. 
Somebody said earlier today, I hope the cameras aren't on and the media is not here, you know, and I won't be popular for saying this, but in my view, we have a federal administration at the moment which is sitting on its hands. And it's missing an enormous opportunity to re-embrace a kaupapa which is going forward. And at this point, I have been inspired by some of the conversations I've been having with some of you, which focus to me around one very interesting dynamic. And it is what Matt has just reminded me, a notion of this country perhaps as an incubation nation, not a petri dish for commercial interests to try out their latest technical toy, with the greatest respect to those of you from that industry. But something far more than that, something where the passion and the excitement of coming to contribute to this economy can be world leading. That we as a small island nation can say to our Scandinavian brothers, yes, we'll work with you. We are not a threatening presence to the hegemons of the world. We are in fact, yes, we have in the past demonstrated sporadic moments of real leadership. Let's see if we can't craft and I'm not talking about a master plan. You heard how much respect I have for master planning, but I'm certainly saying let's try and give voice to a sense of vision, a sense of purpose, and align that to the larger issues which are transnational in their very nature and which we cannot avoid, we cannot hide from. Sure, Australia is probably going to become a burning continent far quicker than, than we will here, but we are not inured from this. And God knows Sam and I, in terms of the experience of the earthquakes and Christchurch have had some first-hand experience of what the impact of major, I'm not saying the earthquake was climate change related, but you certainly get an understanding in the teeth of those sorts of gales of what those who are affected by these issues and will be increasingly going for. So at this point, please, I want to ask Matt to come and join me and I want to ask Matt to re-articulate to you this wonderful idea of the incubation nation. Mark and I, just on break, we're talking more about this notion of incubation nation, and I guess we, we both share this, this passionate idea that, um, that this coherent vision and this leadership role is a possibility uh, for New Zealand. And um, I've, I've felt over the, the past years coming to this place that New Zealand is, is in many ways still a blank canvas for this vision. And so we feel honored to um, play a part in, in stewarding connections and, and collaborations and in terms of painting this. Um, I, I guess one question I have for you, Mark, that given you've studied leadership and that you're on the, the forefront and, and, a, and a tremendous mentor and role model to so many people, um, you know, some of the traditional notions of leadership are uh, also quickly embedded in some of the structures that have caused a lot of these problems with the climate and hierarchical institutions and uh, westernized thinking that, that may not be healthy for the planet. And I'm, I'm curious if you can maybe share some thoughts for um, how new forms of leadership in uh, New Zealand and in coming to New Zealand uh, might look like and what aspiring leaders might, um, might be able to, to take as, as some of your wisdom. Well, that, that's, that's a wonderful question, Matt. Um, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, Firstly, I think, uh, if I can channel Atosa for a moment, um, as many of you will know, Atosa Sultani is fond of telling every audience she addresses that if you put 30% of women into any governance situation, whether it be institutional governance, whether it be business governance, whether it be community governance, the chance of reaching sensible outcomes increases exponentially. <laughs> and <laughs> so, um, and she's not arguing that as a feminist uh, dialectic. She's arguing that based on significant research. Um, and of course, that research is still young because the business as usual, male powerhouse is still just that. I think the other thing I would say in parallels there also with her work is also the voice of indigenous communities. Um, collective leadership, collective ownership, um, has also got a great deal to teach us in terms of the Katiaki principles that we need to be serious about. Having said that, I'm, somebody congratulated me earlier today on being a pragmatist. Um, well, I am. Uh, it's been hard won. Um, I'm still a militant optimist, <laughs> but I'm also long enough in the tooth to have some sense of what's achievable and what isn't. So I think what we have to do is, I talk about the transition economy a lot, moving ourselves away from 
looking in the rear vision mirror, for instance, at an industry which is dying called fossil fuels and transitioning into, into what a 21st century uh, equivalent might be. But there's also, a, a, there's, the reality is the power blocks are what they are. So a lot of the work that I now do is actually man to man, is males with males. And it's about challenging some of the assumptions which we have learned as men particularly those of us who've been privileged to be in positions of power over a great deal of time. And I said, there's, there's a core over there. There's, a, there's, there's an engagement there, man to man, which needs to go on. A great friend of mine died, many of you will know her here in this audience, a couple of weeks ago, Celia Lashley. She began her work in women's prisons. She was an extraordinarily subversive prison governor. But interestingly, when she retired from that role, she invested the rest of her life in working with young men. And the reason for that was that she felt there was an enormous gap in terms of men working with men. And so she started a program which she then got out of the way of, which encouraged more of that. So I think, you know, the, the pragmatists, we have to be real. We talk about transition of any kind, we have to be real in leadership terms. There's a lot of BS about. There's an enormous amount of BS about. Um, where's Russell? Russell Weaver, he's it's gone, not here. Russell and I were talking this morning about the old conundrum of the difference between leadership and management. Right? Okay, well, <laughs> okay. There is schools of thought which would say that these are two very different beasts and they require different skill sets and so on and so forth. And, and, and all of that is, is got merit. There's no question about that. And I'm not saying we dismiss the learnings um, that we have, but I am saying we need to be open to challenging them. And we have to be fearless in that because let's not underestimate. Business as usual is still in control. Those of us who are entrepreneur by instinct I take my hat off to all of us, but we have to be fearless. And we have to also be bright enough to bring these folks with us. Constantly being seen as adversarial, constantly being seen as pointing the borax when you haven't really done your homework, constantly being seen as having some sort of moral virtue which gives you to understand that somehow you're a lesser creature than I because I'm perched on a moral mountain is not going to get us there. The experience in September, which some of you may have been on, in September last year in New York of 400,000 mom and pops marching on climate change with people in Manhattan hanging out of the windows cheering us on was a revelation to me. This was Super Bowl time. But what was most interesting about it, because we actually anticipated 100,000 and we were staggered, never mind the police were terrified when the actual numbers turned out to be what they were, was the energy was about mom and pop. It was not about hierarchy. It was about, it was fearless, it was demanding, but it was palpable. And sure, you know, old hippies like me were there in, in, in numbers, but my God, there was a really strong presence of young people there, which was the thing that also, you know, was so, so in, 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 enthralling. So I don't know if that's answered your question, but I, I, it, there's a combination. I mean, one of my, my mentors is, is Manfred Ketz de Vries, who was the founder of INSEAD. You know, when you go to work on advanced leadership with Manfred, he'll charge you 31,000 euros for, for three weeks, you know, and there's a reason because he can and because he's that good. But his greatest strength is reflective practice. So here's a man with you know, 26 books, 37 honorary doctorates, almost as many as Paul, <laughs> and uh, he's still passionate about learning all the time. So when he's engaging with you as a mentor, it's about let's see what I can gain from you, not, you know. And, and it's lovely to find that, uh, I find, in, in terms of the old paradigm where so often the reverse is true. I'm in the command position and the authority position. And the other metaphor I'd leave you with here, which I think is instructive, is the military. But I'm not talking about the base military. I'm talking about the special ops guys. And for those of you who have had any experience of working with these guys, it's a different dynamic. Why is it different? Because their asses are totally on the line. They are most exposed. They have to have one another's back. There is no posturing in that. There is no pretense in that. The command structure is absolutely to do with survival. Mike Brune and I have been talking about putting climate change on a war footing. Sounds horrendously over the top in one level and theatrical. But there are some lessons that I think, what I mean by being fearless, that we need to continue to nurture around the combination of the urgency and the passion that's going to be required to get us through this rather interesting next 20 years. And I'm afraid that you know, I'm also incredibly cynical about the idea of my generation. I'm a baby boomer. I'm about to, you know, I'm late 50s. 
some of my generation are saying, oh, well, you know, we've done our bit, we'll hand it on to you guys, you know. Okay, we know we're leaving you a mess. Yeah, sorry about that, you know. Well, that's not good enough either. We, we have to stay and play. We have to go the length of the journey. We have to go with you. But we have to bring mom and pop with us. Yeah. Oh. That, that was great. I, I have one more burning question, though. I'd love to, to get the audience in, in on this. The, um, the notion of moving from climate change to climate equality, and you've mentioned some of the principles of leadership around passion and fearlessness, and um, I'm curious, you know, in particular at affecting climate equality, what are some of the characteristics of great leadership uh, that you would advise us on? Well, with luck, we will have uh, a global accord historically for the first time in December in Paris. But that is the beginning of the next chapter. And the, and the next chapter, in terms of the execution of something meaningful from that, will rest fundamentally on climate equity in that sense. So what does that mean? It means that we have to put our money where our mouths are. Those of who have the privilege of living in privileged societies are going to have to be prepared to recognize there is a cost. I think we're also going to have to recognize that when I bring a naughty tong into a room, and this man, for those of you who have not seen him, is emotionally absolutely compelling because he is fundamentally authentic. He is coming from a very deep understanding of the reality of what he faces. And he's coming from that not on the basis of saying to the world, this is your fault that we are in this position and not on the basis of we're a basket case, you need to take us on and help us out. But challenging we to come with his community to build capacity so that they are able to continue the next chapter of their lives with grace and dignity. What does that mean? What's most challenging about that is that fundamentally we're all human beings. And I, and I, so I, I guess, Matt, I'm not sure I'm answering this question well, but, but the, the equity, the climate justice side of this debate is fundamentally challenging for reasons that our previous speaker also voiced in part, which is for those who are most impacted and particularly those who socioeconomically are at the bottom of the tree. We were talking about this in terms of the communities that you work with around the world where the inequalities are most graphic. We have to understand these people don't have the luxury of engaging in a discussion like this. They are facing daily realities uh, of a level of survival which is profound. So, you know, that brings with it a whole other box of tools which, you know, that's why I say go to Kiribati, you know. I can talk to you about Kiribati, but you spend a week there in that situation, and that's the way you're going to understand the sharp end of, of, of the issue. There's, there's no avoiding that. Um, so, yeah, I guess the insight is, is don't get tied up in, in the rhetoric. Don't get tied up in the moral virtue argument. Be aware that people are approaching this issue from very different points of view, depending on their circumstance, and use these. <laughs> you know, people come to me for leadership training, you know, um, and I, I staggered sometimes because I don't say anything, and clearly today I'm saying far too much. But I've tried very hard over recent years to get better at using these, and partly it's a gift because I've now got the technology that I can hear again, but... <laughs> It really is having the self-discipline to use these before you start saying too much too quickly. Yeah. Questions from anyone? Yes, Kenny. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Mark. And I really appreciate what you're saying about the war footing as well. And one of the paradoxes right now is that there are many different interests in play. And there's something I'm sure you're familiar with uh, uh, to do with nightmare coalitions, very unlikely alliances. And two of the really key players that are not talked about sufficiently are the military itself and the insurance industry. 
And both of them are tasked with being reality-based and operationalizing. And it's a very interesting situation in the States because the Pentagon is actually way out front just as they develop jet engines, microprocessors, you know, satellite technology. They're now actually at the, the front of the, the curve in terms of developing clean energy and zero waste bases and so forth. So I wonder if you could comment on um, nightmare coalitions, unusual alliances. Uh, thank you for that, Kenny. I, I think, yes, that's certainly a learning. Um, unlikely alliances, yes, nightmare coalitions, critical. Uh, to have the Admiral of the U.S. Pacific Fleet ask the question, what is the single greatest strategic challenge to the world's global hegemon at this point, his answer is emphatic, climate change. It's not ISIS. <laughs> okay. Um, this is strategic smarts. In this context here, we've heard a bit about the dairy industry in this country, right? I've put a lot of effort at home and another part of my life into making very sure that when we work on sustainability issues in this country, that the dairy industry is at the table because they are so frequently seen as the pariahs. But the reality for agriculture in this country going forward is that, again, thanks to the kind of technical expertise that's in this room, the New, Zealand, New Zealand's future agriculturally is tied up with intensive cropping of far more uh, value-laden product than dirty cows. And your generation in this country is fast beginning to realize that. So I've been putting a bit of effort into the training of young farmers. Uh, Sam was mentioning conversations with his dad. And I've got two uncles who are farmers, and, and, and it is a very different world now when you look at some of the graduates coming out of farming training in this country, because they realize the significance not only of the relationship between economy and environment, um, but in their own best practice that they need to get a hell of a lot smarter about addressing real value from this feed the world opportunity that this country likes to think it has. So absolutely applaud that. And politically also, I mean... I have spent, as I'm sure you have, Kenny, over far too many years, a great deal of time working with politicians of all kinds. And whether they be on the liberal side of the equation and they start out with a wonderful vision and then we get disillusioned, or whether they are you know, quite obviously um, very conservative in their views, the, it, it is absolutely critical that we do not ignore that the political classes have to be part of the solution. So we can't just, a lot of people sort of seem to think we can absent ourselves from the politics, we don't care, we're not even gonna bother to vote. Well, how the hell do you build a, a global citizenry if people aren't gonna actually take part in the process? So there's a lot of hard work to be done in the political sphere as well. And, and, and I often spend a lot of time these days with conservative politicians, not liberals, with conservative politicians. And, uh, and I'm sure you, you would actually agree with me, uh, my brother back there, in terms of the, the Maori renaissance in this country, in terms of the settlement, the tribal settlement program, the great irony here is that the progenitor of that, in large part, was not a left-wing government. It was, in fact, a centre-right government. And uh, so, again, these unnatural alliances are very powerful if you can be smart about how you actually engage. Yeah. Questions? Uh, kia ora, Mark. I'm really interested in the uh, shadow side of the conversation about culture and heritage and also about climate change. And um, I see a lot of attention and energy put on creating the solutions, the low carbon solutions, while at the same time uh, I'm still investing in fossil fuels. And uh, I've done screening of the managed funds sector in New Zealand and the KiwiSaver funds. There's still a lot of money in there, and I just wonder about um, your view on disclosure and uh, talking more about the risk of stranded assets uh, in, the, in this conversation. If you're in that business, in the front line of that business, then I encourage you absolutely to be as public as possible in as many fora as you can in the media about the stranded assets argument. Absolutely. Our own largest sovereign fund, as you say, KiwiSafe, is still heavily vested in fossil fuels. What does that mean to mom and pop's retirement funds going forward? If you take uh, Jeremy Leggett's argument, it means that they're putting their futures on the line. Um, and I think that it's inevitable in the next decade or so, uh, we will start to see major impact of people realising that those assets are stranded. And what does that do to the value of, of your retirement savings or, or whatever you invest? But the other side is, I think, let's also be clear that, um, again, it speaks to the laziness of a nation, in my view, uh, be it the investment public of that nation, if they simply take at face value that 
the markets are going to actually give them the answer here in terms of doing very little but taking the advice of the markets in that sense. They need to do a bit of homework. They need to go to guys like you and actually ask the questions, you know. How can I actually um, have more knowledge of what I'm choosing and where I'm choosing to put my money, question number one. And what does that mean in terms of future scenarios going forward uh, over the next decade or so? And we, in this country, there's very, very, very little discourse in the investment markets, and there needs to be. Jeremy's put a bomb under them in the UK, and it's very interesting, and the Rockefeller Foundation is funding him to do that work. And when he started, he was he was treated as a pariah. Now their doors are being knocked down by investment advisors. So it can happen, and that's happened in two or three years. So I would just encourage you, to, if you're in that industry, to be as vocal and as public and as provocative as you can be. Because where the smart money goes, we all know this. Where the smart money goes, so too does the pace of change um, following. Hmm. Uh, kia ora, Mark. Um, thank you for the hard questions and the hard talk. Um, really welcome. What's the place of the margins in these sorts of debates? You know, it's been said that New Zealand, it's both warmth and defiance. We see it in our Maori communities. Perhaps we see it in some of our more proactive, visionary political stances. Um, but it seems to me these sorts of spaces right here are, are rather rare, and it seems this is where we can actually really get the energy going, have the affirmation, have this hard talk, but what's the next step? You, you spend a lot of your time on the margins. Well, uh, Regenda Pachari and I have monthly updates on the state of the planetary science, right? And believe me, they uh, not fun reading. Um, I believe the way forward uh, is going to be in social science, not in pure science that we have to get a hell of a lot smarter at utilizing this extraordinary uh, world we now live in in terms of social interaction at multiple levels through multiple portals to ensure that um, the margins, as you call them, are engaged. There is no excuse in this day and age. You know, if, if Strive Masariwa, for God's sake, can put the most advanced uh, cell technology in the hands of impoverished Africans, and leapfrog the rest of the world. There is no excuse technologically why we can't achieve in ensuring the margins are part of this uh, engagement and conversation. And, and I think in this country, you know, as we've just heard from Peter, I mean, there's still a massive mismatch in terms of some of our marginal communities here, um, in terms of even being offered the opportunity to engage. And, uh, and there's simply no excuse for that. There, there is no excuse for that. But that implies uh, genuinely creative design in the processes. Um, I'm a great fan of making sure that your scoping is good, that you have done the requisite homework to understand what is the best design of process which is going to bring you to uh, a greater chance of resolution of an issue, no matter what the issue is, frankly. Um, and, um, and then, for God's sake, find a way, as this wonderful gathering has done in so many ways, to enliven the moment every half an hour or so, to have Elijah do some, present some wonderful magic, to have this wonderful energy um, brought to us all in the room, you know? I mean, we're all human beings. Yeah. For fuck's sake, yeah. give people... <laughs> give, give, give them an opportunity to dance, you know? Yeah. Well, one last question from Evan, who's been asking for it. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, so you've gotten to now observe and interact with this um, relatively small group of newly recognized diverse leaders. Um, any, um, any patterns or traits or approaches that they have in common that we may not have heard about in you know, the popular pop leadership literature, anything you've observed that you found particularly interesting? Uh, thank you for that question. It was, uh, it was asked of me um, at lunchtime. Um, and um, my answer was that if there is one common thread, and I mean, we haven't discovered most of these people. They are in mid-career, you know. I mean, Peggy Lou's a poster child for clean tech in China, you know. Um, but the primacy the metaphor I used was many, many years ago as a director in the theatre, I, I, I evicted Russell Crowe from a, re a rehearsal room, right? He was about 22 at the time, and he was an asshole. And what Russell was doing was taking everyone else in that rehearsal's room energy and sucking it up. And it was all about Russell, and it was all about Russell's ego, right? 
Many years later in Melbourne, I met his wife, Danny, in the street in Melbourne, and I said, I want you to tell Russell, please, from me, that he has matured out of sight as an actor. Um, he had just done a wonderful film uh, called The Insider, which some of you, I'm sure, would have seen, and this was a mature performance for which he was on it. And I was staggered at the growth in him, and I said to Danny, look, somebody got through to him. It wasn't me. Somebody got through to him. She said, well, he did this film in Australia called Romper Stomper with Peter Cox, and that was the film where he played a skinhead. And that was the film that got him an entree into Hollywood and then the rest became gradually uh, developmental path. The point I was making, and, I said, and then Danny said to me, he's still an asshole. <laughs> and I said, great, but please congratulate him because the difference is here, he has learned it's not about Russell. It's about the craft. It's about the work. Uh, the man is still the man. He's a wonderful, complex character and he's still an asshole. The learning that I have gained from these people is in every case, the laureates that we've been privileged to choose, in every case, it is about the work. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have an ego. They all have an ego. But it is primarily about the work. It is about the duende. It is about the passion that's driving them. It is about the larger whole. Uh, it is about a sense of community. Uh, it's not about... Me, 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 me. And in terms of some of that lovely stuff we heard yesterday from some of our, uh, our women colleagues, it's certainly not about the whole objectification, pretty, 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 putting on the right costume stuff, you know. So I, I guess that's the fundament, that, that what they have in common is that. It's about the work, it's not about the individual. Uh, please join me in, uh, in, in honoring and, and thanking Mark. <laughs> <laughs>